Hello, Kenneth. Hello, Cooley. Hi. Hi, William. Very nice to have you here. Of course, we would wish to have you here alive. Uh, let's maybe start a little bit introducing uh, why we uh, developed together with you project Sound Action Space Cross Discipline Practices for Contemporary Performer. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, currently uh, it seems there is not so much space in uh, traditional art schools or performing art schools for developing new ways of working with the expression of performer, which are on the borders of uh, different genres, we could say, or of a different form of arts. So we could say that uh, many of that research is in hands of uh, uh, laboratory uh, performing companies as you are and or as we are which are later on then sharing through their work uh, for other people, other students, what they discovered, what they achieved. And thus, uh, the nature of such companies is to move things forward uh, towards a new horizons, towards new possibilities. Uh, let me introduce uh, uh, also who is here in Prague now. So, uh, my name is William from Farm in the Cape, Hanna Varadzinova from Farm in the Cape, Kaliska Vavříková. We are funding members. Here is Anneli Jeromin, the production manager out of the frame. Uh, and this is uh, Bara Nechanicka, Omar Torito from Spain, Joel Kocha from Italy, uh, Andrej Štepita from Slovakia. Uh, here we have uh, Lukas Blaha, Czech Republic, uh, Bara Yeshutova from Czech Republic and Eleftheria Iliopou from Greece. And all of these are in the same time performers, but also teachers and also researchers who are uh, uh, inside of this project uh, interested to get inspired by some of the working practices or ideas of uh, company Rosna Fleck means uh, Kenneth Fleck and Kuli Rosna. And in the same time, they are working with Farm in the Cave on our practices inside of the frame of FMRI project, uh, which we work currently right now. Of course, uh, due to pandemic situation, unfortunately, we could not meet here in Prague with Kenneth and Kuli alive so we could not be sharing our experiences alive. Therefore, uh, uh, Kenneth and Cooley prepared two very beautiful videos. One is called Retrospective and another one, Sound, Action and Space. First one describes with a wonderful samples 10 years of chosen projects of uh, uh, Rosna Fleck Company. Uh, some of them commissioned in a different countries, some of them done by Rosna Fleck Company. Uh, the second uh, uh, movie describes more the way uh, how uh, Kenneth and Cooley are working currently mostly with the Mini B sensors. Uh, they will speak a little bit more about it and show us their uh, introduction or their instruction, sorry, instruction. Basically, we could say that uh, of the info for uh, the audience who is now observing us, there will be more observers uh, who are not sitting here right now. And those are students of Duncan Center, who, uh, which is the, of course, Dance Academy in Prague, led by Monika Chastkova, who is also a collaborator of Farm in the Cave. And uh, everyone can find, uh, hopefully it's uh, generally open, on the Vimeo of Rosna Flag Company, these two beautiful, uh, uh, we could say, videos, which Kenneth and Cooley wonderfully prepared about their work. So, uh, just uh, shortly to say, uh, we, thanks to Fund for Bilateral Relations, we were, we are already collaborating with Kenneth and Cooley 
since maybe 216, something like that. Maybe 215, we already started a dog center for contemporary art, but then uh, uh, they were uh, collaborating with us when we were working also with uh, elderly people, seniors, on another project. And uh, we keep in uh, common relations further and further. And we are, of course, very curious to see where uh, Rosnafle company is moving and on the way they are thinking. We could say that uh, what is a little bit similar for both of our companies is that uh, we are not only satisfied working with the movement itself, but we love to start working with the sound but each company works with the sound in a different way and also we are uh, interested to somehow reflect upon uh, contemporary issues in the society uh, both of our comp companies are trying to in get inspired by what's going on right here right now so uh, maybe now is the time i would uh, give uh, 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 space for uh, uh, Kenneth and Cooley to talk about a little bit from their perspective and also maybe introduce to us uh, the short maybe instruction of how they are currently working or they are currently developing in the frame of sound, action and space. Mm. Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, so I think we... Um... Uh, maybe first, uh, William, thank you for this task also for us, because it actually was a fun task for us to do both of these videos here, uh, just even to think back 10 years and uh, also try to articulate uh, for um, this video, what do we think about these topics, uh, sound, action, space, which is so naturally like our part of our thinking space when we create mm. art. And... Um, uh, I, I think it's uh, maybe it's good to start with this little uh, demonstration uh, uh, how we use sound through the action and uh, uh, possible it becomes possible through this uh, mini B movement sensors. So these are our this is our toolkit, isn't it? Already yeah. for six years, seven years even. Yeah, since um, 2014, roughly. yeah, 13, 14 that maybe the idea is like this, that we do uh, 10 minutes of little showing mm -hmm. and then we continue reflecting and uh, mm -hmm. and telling a little bit more verbally <laughs> what just happened. Uh, so it's uh, something to yeah, reflect yeah, on. Exactly. Um, yeah, let's see. I'm going to mute the microphone so you will get the feed directly from the program, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, you don't hear us, huh? Okay, just one second. Well, of course, technical problems is always a thing. She had the mini B sensor, and by moving her hand, she wanted to show us how the sound would change, correct? Yeah. Um, so, um, I am. Okay, I know what was the problem. Just cool. One uh, little second, I will uh, deal with that. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe, meanwhile, you uh, uh, solve this. I would just like to point that uh, uh, your company for the audience started for the first time working with the mini B sensors, uh, especially during around the project called Blood Music, if I'm correct, in 2014, which yeah. was Kuli's solo. 
yeah. uh, which she presented in uh, uh, Estonia, correct? Uh, Estonia. Oh, oh, it was awarded in Estonia. It was. Yeah. Uh, or it was nominated for uh, it was nominated for the experimental uh, award. Yeah, um, I right. remember the precise name of the award, but uh, just to say, so maybe now we can carry on. Yeah, that's it. Now hopefully it should work. Okay, let's try. Uh, let's try, and uh, this is part of the deal. Technical mm -hmm. challenges. We are. Used <laughs> of course, to... we all are. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing. Yeah. So I'll mute our microphone now. Mm -hmm. What do you hear? Strange attractor. What do you feel? What are you focusing on? What do you see now? Why did we come here to create? Loads of what physics seeking clarity, more than simply angle of the ground, multiplied by the last Strange level decimal plus five equals why we came here today. Loads of physics seeking what clarity, hear, more than simplicity. What changes what you if you focus on your focusing? What you hit? To create, what do you feel? Mistake. Why did we come here to create? First thing, what changes is to stop if you focus on your reality? Focus. What do you feel? What, do you see now? Here? what are you focusing on? What do you hear? What do you feel? What do you hear? Seeking clarity more than simplicity. What do you hear? What changes First if you focus what are you focusing on wishing reality to create into a perspective union of the joints in the a jointed area, area, limited area? What are you focusing on? Mistake.
Is the master of light, gravity, gravity is gravity is the root. Okay. So that, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kenneth. Thank you, Kuli. It was more than instruction. It was wonderful performers. performance. <laughs> First, seeing uh, the dialogue of your beautiful palms and then going to whole body, um, going through different sound landscapes. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was very interesting for me to watch. Also, I felt kind of story behind it. So uh, maybe if you would like to add something or shall we already go to questions or um, maybe you would prefer to speak a bit more about it? Yeah, we could um, actually, maybe we, we thought maybe we could actually even explain a little bit uh, some of the principles behind the different sound landscapes uh, <clears throat> that we were working on. So uh, first of all, these are the famous sensors the mini bees. That's how big they are. Kind of small. <laughs> <laughs> they are like in. We have made up this design so we can have a, yeah them comfortably mm -hmm. around our wrists or ankles. But uh, of course, the research also goes where else could they be and what else uh, mm. can be done with the sensors. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, but I'm just going to like chronologically go through what uh, what this was. The the very first part was a, a simple game of triggering text snippets, and uh, they the each snippet is uh, randomly selected <clears throat> when the movement energy exceeds a certain threshold, basically. So it's like a pool of uh, different text bits. And uh, the program just selects randomly from those, and which kind of creates uh, interesting uh, semantics in a way. Also, because we never really know what's going to come. Uh, we know the pool, but we don't know in which order how it will will come. And that, this is like a one uh, opportunity to play like this: that you have a pool of uh, expressions, recordings, or you chop up a sentence. But uh, there is also uh, a different way when the sensors can recognize uh, your posture. They recognize the relative position towards each other. So then you can actually uh, really talk, uh, a clear talk. Or you can put uh, uh, piano sounds like an octave of piano sounds and may, m play also clear melody, for example, if you want to. Mm. But recently, uh, we've been wanting more this kind of uh, unpredictability that we don't know uh, when it comes to semantic space or also the, the, the piano uh, that was yeah. after. And then maybe uh, to say something about this, uh, uh, like the text uh, for us is uh, quite uh, important. In every piece, we use it somehow, but we do not uh, want to express the full meaning of the piece through this uh, couple of words or, uh, or or parts of the text, but they are uh, creating their functioning as a texture or imagery triggers uh, rather. So uh, that's why it's a good tool for us uh, to bring in words that trigger meanings in audience. Mm. Uh, but um, uh, another thing about this uh, uh, what the sensors uh, give us. Uh, for example, now we uh, relate more and more with m musicians. And there, uh, we are invited to participate, for example, in a workshop where the topic is 22 uh, tone scale, uh, microtonality. So, so we, we can actually uh, play mm. uh, this piano voice in this 22 tone scale which is a specific to uh, m music, a specific uh, thing, and we can actually practically play it. So it's uh, in that way, it's a quite a handy practical tool. And they and they, even musicians, they could use us <laughs> to see what can happen, you know, like because uh, there is this yeah. possibility. Yeah, exactly. Just quickly, like the 22 tone scale is, uh, uh, I mean, in, in um, Western music, we're used to dividing the octave into 12. Uh, 12 divisions, uh, 22 tone scale is uh, where you divide the octave into 22 uh, equal uh, equal uh, steps. So each step is 55 cents, uh, basically. Uh, and um, yeah, there's a whole body of math behind it. And uh, we're not so familiar with it, but we just now started working with the musicians that are actually dealing with it. So uh, we wanted to test this as well. And, and through uh, the Super Collider program. It's yeah, with Super Collider, access. it's quite easy to uh, to work with these things. And uh, we uh, we were happy to... Um, uh, for me, what, what's quite interesting about this scale specifically is that it really challenges my sense of pitch because it sounds like an out of tune piano completely. But uh, at the same time, it's actually, I mean, my sense of tuning is of course a cultural construct. Uh, and it's just the tuning that I'm used to, the 12 tone tone scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, next. Chunk. Yeah, like uh, for, ex yeah, and this was kind of very specific to music and music um, theory. Uh, yeah. theory. <clears throat> uh, but the other way for us, which is very interesting is that we use recordings and the next, uh, uh, part uh, which was this more struggly, uh, struggly sound that we, we were like <laughs> shaking each other here a little bit. Uh, basically, it's just uh, uh, bare feet uh, walking in the dance floor, uh, but then uh, processed and transformed. So uh, it's it's for us it's quite uh, amusing and cool when something uh, becomes very different. And actually, in our piece, we were uh, we had a good sound system, so uh, we we were really pushing this sound to its limits, and uh, people kind of saw it as an earthquake and. Uh, forces of nature but uh, of course how we got it was just recording our own uh, steps uh, 
uh, stepping on the dance floor. So, yep. uh, so, so this kind of music or sound transformations that enable us to then also lend our own Im imagery or imagination and create this sort of earthquake uh, feeling on stage uh, mm. are quite uh, quite interesting. Yeah. And the process specifically is uh, called granular synthesis, if uh, you're uh, familiar with that. So chopping the sound into tiny little chunks and playing with that, basically. Mm -hmm. um, next bit. It's the random. Random select. Yeah, because mm -hmm. um, a lot of the algorithms that we use, most of the algorithms we use, use create uh, like one specific sound space. Like each algorithm has its own little sound space with its own specific uh, pool of sounds, uh, mostly, and mostly it's a random selection of those. And in this part, when we're on the on the wall, and uh, they, uh, we we work with uh, an algorithm that selects algorithms randomly. So each sensor gets its own sound space randomly assigned uh, from all these uh, different pools, uh, or like from some different pools that we have. They, I think it's eight different pools of uh, of sounds, eight different sound spaces. So each limb basically gets its own sonic character, its own landscape, its own uh, feeling and its own uh, semantic uh, luggage, let's say. And um, that keeps also changing with irregular intervals as well, randomly selected. And there is possibility to really engineer the space more carefully than when you just record a lot of sounds, put them in one pool and then they randomly come. Mm. But through this uh, thing is much more you can choose what you want to be more a uh, mm. chance to happen and um, yeah uh, like, yeah while at the same it. time maintaining a very unpredictable uh, yeah. feeling like you don't actually know which sounds are coming but once the sound is there you can rely on it staying for a little while yeah. before it changes again um then we went into something more percussive which was uh, recordings of uh, breaking wood uh, different uh, sounds and uh, also uh, and granular, granularized and uh, selected randomly into a more percussive thing. Yeah, and uh, just to conclude, like for us, it was one of our aim, aim was to have this kind of a modular cap capacity <laughs> that we have these mm -hmm. different algorithms kind of ready and different uh, uh, sounds. Uh, but uh, then we could just put together based on how we uh, feel like that could and then change a couple of sound here and there, or uh, mm -hmm. put some new text in there, and uh, so this kind of a uh, yeah modular uh, capacity or modular readiness um, to react uh, to different contexts, yep. like whether it's our performance or is it's a concert. Uh, there has been also uh, there is a concert where we are supposed to participate as a concert uh, performer, so it's more towards the music. So. So it's it's interesting just basically the research like this. Hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Yes, I'm, I can sense it's uh, many questions popping up in all the minds around me and behind me. So perhaps now uh, let's have a space for questions. If anyone would like to ask something, uh, maybe it's the time. Okay, so it's Lucas. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Uh, I have a technical question regarding what exact parameters are being recorded and influenced uh, by the micro V sensors. So I can sense that there is definitely velocity, but as to spatial, or if it's like calculating the space in between the individual sensors, but what is it that is all being. Uh, all being recorded. For example, if I'm holding my, my hand still, but moving the fingers, it is somehow also uh, yeah. being sensed by the sensors, or is it really just uh, the motion and action of the fist? Oh, of the um, fist yeah, they are accel uh, accelerometers. So uh, similar to what you have in your phone, basically. So uh, uh, the axes are, there are three, three axes, we call X, Y, and Z axis, and, and that's, Basically, it's so it's three. It's a so-called three DOF, uh, three degrees of freedom uh, accelerometers that then transmit that information, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the processing of that data is happening in. Uh, so I get I get the raw data through uh, OSC, Open Sound Control, mm -hmm. from the Minibees into uh, Super Collider, and in Super Collider I do the the further 
transformation of the processing of it, like normalizing it to a range between zero and one, for example, to make sure, and uh, and also calculating the what we call the delta value, which is the difference between the current position and the previous position. Okay. And if that difference is high, we know that it's been there's been a lot of movement happening. Mm -hmm. So, so basically, it's kind of uh, right now in this demonstration, sensors were uh, sensing the amount of movement or the intensity. So if I manage to move my fingers so that the wrist is not really moving along, then there is no sound. Mm -hmm. so, so it's really about how much movement happens uh, in, uh, in this uh, sensor area. Was but but the sensors also like in it uh, here they, they can uh, sense also just we can uh, put like uh, that the pitch goes up everything goes very uh, high up mm. and then it goes down they can do that but not in this uh, demonstration now it was just purely about the amount of movement and mm. uh, a lot of movement things go loud and <laughs> yep. loud and uh, intense and uh, no movement there is should be silence and and the kind of the very practical thing is the threshold so basically the threshold was uh, really uh, high here a uh, low low oh, here yep. so in a, in a way that very uh, very small movement actually did trigger something so you could uh, you could play with this how much you want to have like for example in the performance maybe i'm naturally breathing a lot and then it's every you know every little micro movement could already activate uh, so so i have to be knowing my own body how how high the threshold should be so mm. so th there is this kind of tuning the sensor yeah exactly and so just to like also re recap so the 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 mini beats themselves they send the apps the acceleration data uh in relation to gravity in fact <clears throat> and um, those are sent to supercollider where i where they are scaled uh into a range between zero and one and that data is further processed into figuring out, for example, what is the movement energy. So, uh, and that, uh, and like, for example, in what Gulli described, the delta value is the value between this and the previous value. And if that is high enough over a certain threshold, it triggers an event. And that event could be anything. Um, in the previous piece, we actually also used that to trigger light events, for example. So you can, if, you know, you can send numbers anywhere. You could use it to, uh, control the video as well so there are um, basically anything that uh, anything that speaks a number you can control or influence uh, through this and of course you can make it reverse that when you do move then there is no sound and when you are still then the sound <laughs> explodes like all, all the possibilities there and then have imagination the, for the performance uh, situation what could be done with that Thank you. Any more questions? I have a question. Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, in, in your research and performance, the, the sound is almost digital, of course, and, and like uh, you use a lot of this technology, technological sound. But I want to ask you if in your, in your research philosophy, there is a possibility to have uh, a sound that we can define like natural that uh, that can be more in connection with the nature if you are if you are i don't know thinking in about acoustic it. you mean acoustic yes or? Uh, acoustic or, or also like with um not digital but like analogic like uh mm. yeah actually only. yeah actually most of our source material is uh, our recordings from nature or from uh, speech or from from something and then further processed so uh, it's it's fully possible it's kind of a sliding scale between the kind of highly digital world and uh, and the completely uh, organic let's say and um, I think we've been quite interested also in this how do you uh, shift a little bit the perspective so how do you make the organically recorded sounds sound weird and otherworldly uh, on one hand but then again how do you make digital sounds sound organic you know, so there's this kind of uh, <clears throat> um, dialectic almost between the, the digital and the analog domain 
and uh, also like uh, actually now it was synthesized this piano yeah. but uh, in our piece we use uh, real recordings of the piano and then we just transform them like in the end of the scene mm. just something happens uh, weirdness to, uh, to this and mm. and we've used cello sounds and uh, water and uh, all this uh, we are actually really interested in the same thing, like how to bring the natural feeling, but uh, then also like how, how can we create from the synth uh, synthesize mm. some kind of thing that actually feels quite familiar in some reason. <laughs> or brings yeah. up some. Yeah, feels uh, almost physical, <clears throat> I would say. Mm. How do you make it physical, bodily sensation, like a uh, trigger, like uh, because um, I think the, the main thing still is that we are uh, even more than the de development of technology, we're interested in sensation, in uh, experience, in how we as humans process all this stuff. That is um, still kind of the, the focal point of everything that we do. It's about the body, it's about the movement, it's about our experience. experience. And, and we are still uh, completely uh, in, in amazed by this, um, uh, just the fact that my movement produce this sound it's just kinesthetic ex uh, effect or it, it's just something like that uh, <laughs> you you cannot uh, not not uh, be uh, amazed by when you're actually doing it and there is a different uh, kind of result mm. uh, that it's not just the movement or uh, but there is something else so that that's why we are we're very much grounded in the body actually still but mm respecting the limb of sound uh, a lot also so uh, yeah researching yeah. that thank you hmm. Can I? yes okay so, so uh, my question is um mostly regarding to the movement creation uh when it comes to a specific performance with a topic and a subject you want to communicate so I was trying to think how the research of the movement creation and if you could call vocabulary could be with the sensors. Because of course I, I, I'm thinking that the perspective of how you perceive the movement changes totally because you don't judge it anymore safe wise or of course you know the sound that is created. So what I want to ask is how you deal with uh, what kind of action or movement would be most suitable to communicate a specific idea? If it's more about the sound that is being created or the structure of the body that it creates this kind of sound, somehow, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I could not unfortunately hear the full uh, explanation of the question, but uh, but I un un I think I understand uh, actually the the question. But uh, uh, so so basically, throughout this time, we have uh, identified three uh, ways uh, to deal with the sensors. That, for, for example, uh, one uh, option is that I do a choreography like maybe it's a set phrase and uh, or i am improvising and my full attention goes to my body and my situation and then sound is just something that follows and i do not pay extra attention to the sound so that's a one uh, one way so the opposite kind of could be that I try to play a certain music and um, this could be a text score. You can play a text or you can play a certain melody that, um, like I, I talked before about the uh, posture recognition, so you can be actually very precise how you play a uh, uh, music uh, melody, musical melody. So, and then my aim really is like, I am a, more like a, a concert performer. <laughs> uh, and, and um, you know, this endless research also how you, how you do that actually, like how you, what, what choices would you, meet, uh, would you actually make when you want to create the sound? When it's fixed, okay, then you play the score, but when it's not fixed and you want to play the, uh, play, play the interesting music and then the third one which we generally like to do the most or makes mm. sense to do the most because we're not living in this polarities only is is the combination that you are uh, you are really focused uh, you, you allow the unexpectedness of your physicality 
you come and uh, change stuff in uh, in the sound and you take the sound in and allow your your physicality to you know uh, be uh, influenced and uh, amazed or whatever like uh, or, or uh, and 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 uh, there is uh, another one um, uh, very interesting thing as well when you find the situation or you find like uh, 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 th thing where in involuntary movements happen. Like, uh, let's say that uh, people are just grabbing uh, one person and they start to shake this person around and this person has no uh, control over the movements. But there is a lot of movement happening and uh, there is a lot of sound because of this chain reaction uh, happening. So this, this kind of uh, uh, very cool, um, yeah, Cool possibilities but i think in general it fits into these three possibilities like either movement first the sound first or they are really combined and you can uh, go in the scale where you feel it's more uh, relevant mm. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah it's very interesting uh, uh, for me, I'm not sure if I understood well. In the beginning of your, um, uh, for me, it was performance, however you can call it, like instruction video, there were sentences with questions. Then it was uh, going to, uh, I'm, I'm not sure where the piano was appearing, but then there, there were this kind of cracking sound, yeah. in the end. And then again, a, bit, a little bit of sentence, but it, felt like everything was wonderfully composed. Uh, so I was wondering whether you have these pools, as you call it, like uh, coming in certain periods. Mm. So for example, it starts here in the timing, then the first pool is reacting, then the second pool reacting, then the second, all of them in the same time, or it's even this is accidental. So you yeah. start moving and there will be cracking, but not the sentences in the beginning. Yeah. No, it's, um, th this is composed on a timeline. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Wonderfully composed. I must say. Thank <laughs> and of course you could uh, play with the pools the same way that you don't know <laughs> that, that uh, it, it's, it's also an interesting challenge. It depends how much you want to be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's uh, for us very interesting because uh, just to introduce uh, how we in our company got to the sound and to the something that we called action. I think it was uh, due to our training and the limits. Uh, we were uh, working on the project Sklavi the Song of an Emigrant based on the polyphonic singing of Rutenian ethnic group in Slovakia and none of us was trained singer so uh, we were practicing how to sing polyphonic songs together and the way and how to keep uh, listening to each other uh, and how to create certain vibratory qualities together because that performance was based on a transformed polyphonic song that we're really singing on stage and I must say that uh, this uh, taught us how to move. Mm. The way how we were uh, holding the breath, letting the breath go out, the way how we were in the same time trying to uh, focus on our own voice and the voice of the partner taught us the movement. Mm. Much more interesting, in a much more interesting way than if we would try to build up the movement itself. Yeah. So, uh, uh, from this perspective, or maybe I, I'm just speaking about this experience only from the perspective of explaining that this was one of the training lines that later on we developed in a such a way that now when we move, we already, I mean, the older members of Farm in the Cave. Uh, we already kind of visualize or imagine what your mini bees would be doing. All right. You know what I mean? So already by shifting the weight or by the by the making small movement, by doing it sharper, we uh, are uh, 
naturally working with the ear imagination or with the sound imagination. Mm. Uh, having this in a link with what I said that we were uh, singing in one of the training lines of our work. I think we were singing for four or five years repeatedly, constantly in the beginning of our company. So this is what I would like to say how we came uh, to the uh, to the um, imagination or to the practice that the sound for us is the movement and movement is for us the sound. So mm -hmm. when we were singing, we were imagining where we are sending the voice, how much the voice is occupying the space, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what quality the voice is carried, uh, where is the target of the voice. So we were imagining that the voice is moving as it would be prolongation of the body. And when we work with the movement, I was especially to Eliska often saying, sing it, sing it through the body. And through that way, I could see that she developed her way of uh, uh, phrasing the movement, her way of articulating, her way of creating uh, 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 the dynamic or sentences the, the physical sentences through the body. So this was our uh, uh, approach without the technology, but yet I think uh, meeting very uh, important uh, aspect of dematerializing focus, just having a physical focus, because the body is not just a piece of flesh, you know. Uh, we know that uh, we are partly uh, just the vibrations, you know, we all, I mean, us mm -hmm. as human beings. And uh, I think this kind of focus on the vibratory quality of the movement, whatever way it's done, can maybe focus ourselves really on energy we are carrying. Or because also this very soft, as you mentioned, that the breathing can influence, everything can influence the energy the current state. So I believe that this could be the way how performers are more focused on the state of what they are bringing rather than just the shapes, you know, which they, so it's not anymore about just showing the movement as something to be shown, but the movement as the something that is reaching you directly, isn't it? I could even uh, try to say that <laughs> uh, sometimes it's it's a real journey. Like uh, be, uh, with our tools, I can talk uh, from that perspective. But uh, even on in performance, or sometimes it can get emotional, or it can get a bit trippy because uh, <laughs> you are kind of uh, extended. You you are out of your uh, normal. <laughs> functioning so uh, and I kind of invite it as well so uh, I don't want to sound too uh, too far out but it's it's a little bit like a, a kind of a prayer as well you meet you meet the, this unknown uh, space uh, because of this to the relationship and the, uh, and this is so concrete as well so that's why it's you you can trust that it it can really happen mm. And this, I think there's something uh, in that in that vein also about um, I think for uh, we we're searching for some kind of a transparency. I think um, that I think it's very much relating to what you're saying about like not just showing a shape, uh, but this uh, this feeling of the allowing something to pass through you, mm -hmm. whatever that is, um, if it's a you know sound or. Um, I find actually the the um, singing actually I think I think is a very good um, uh, entrance point also because it is so connected to the breathing it's so connected to the whole uh, torso the whole kind of core of your uh, of your body as well that you know like you have to engage everything uh, within you in order to sing uh, sing well <clears throat> as well so. I think that is that is for us also very much the the thing like we both we use voice actually a we lot. use voice yeah. a lot also um, in the last piece we uh, we were also using microphones a lot uh, in the prime mover we had a whole long section which was just purely breath based 
now also we used yeah. actually deliberately yeah. a very quite intense breathing just yeah. to get the, again the things connected <laughs> it's yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it seems that uh, there's also quite uh, interesting how both of our companies are uh, kind of really uh, understanding somehow that the ear is in the same time center of listening or the, that organ inner ear but in the same time is the center of balance yeah mm -hmm. so i think uh, whatever mover whether it's dancer actor or uh, or juggler it's pretty differently moving and having very different focus when he or she is listening to what's going on because that also opens what you call responsivity mm. the quality of being responsive it is not closed in your own a predicted choreography closed model but anytime something whatever can happen and you don't know what will happen so by you using uh, mini b sensors it seems or what would be interesting for me to also experience it on my body that if i move i can be surprised what sound will appear from which pool it will come and that gives me situation that can immediately associate and that will change immediately uh, even there is kind of the fixed choreography under but i don't know what it will produce and how it will affect me so that can keep my ability to be open in every moment to what is going happen mm. so we often uh, use the exercise uh, called contact nozzle uh, where we don't know you are all the time focused on the partner being in connection and you never know where partner will move, but you always have to, through the contact, follow the partner, then you lead the partner, then you exchange. But that gives another important quality also in our work is this permanent listening to what happens to the partner. So somehow you made not yourself the most important at that moment, but what happens, the yeah. situation that happens. So because it seems that if uh, the performer is uh more like locked inside of uh, his own performance means like a fixed choreography fixed shapes whatever is fixed uh but not undertaking journey to unknown by every millimeter of his movement it seems the story it's already not alive correct yep. uh, so it seems that also by you uh throwing yourself into that unknown territory that each small movement each small gesture can bring a new sound which will emotionally have impact immediately on you or on the partner uh, it's opening something which is the second important topic which we call action because i think uh, action cannot happen because action is for me something that changing everything in the space if the performer makes a real action he or she will change everything that was before somehow the things changes and that is connected with being open to the moment and confessing we don't know what the moment will bring because of course it's right here right now so it can give i don't i'm not sure if you can follow me it can give everything what we say that even if you have to respond to the partner and the partner did something a bit later but you are already automatically moving you are not in the moment so it's with the same with the mini bees you know because they are kind of the partners they are your partners that are giving you some kind of unexpected situation even if it's the sound situation that immediately can influence you correct mm. Yes, and uh, one uh, word or thing that we um, remember all the time is attention and, uh, and it's the focus itself because uh, we kind of like this idea that um, actually we sense all the time, our receptors take info all the time, but once you bring your attention, you perceive something. Like when we say that uh, uh, you have a socks now on and your feet are connecting to the floor, then everybody think of the feet and uh, uh, then now our, that our attention is there. But the same thing happens with a sensor that uh, when you just you can try this like uh, you leave your right hand without the sensor and left hand with the sensor 
even though you're right-handed, you usually start to move from right, then suddenly so much more attention and awareness and listening to the left side. So, and now if we, so this, this kind of, you are just so much stretched out, widened and uh, sort of, um, uh, you are a different person, you know, or like, mm. uh, and, and yeah, and when you put it for uh, like all the limbs, uh, you know, then you can basically fly or something like uh, <laughs> So it's the question of attention a lot for us. And, and, mm. and the other thing is the partner can be the one who brings the attention. This or also we do in the workshops as well. Eh? Yeah. 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 We call that kind of focus on one part nozzle in our world. The nozzle is something that, of course, uh, focus the stream in, in, into certain direction. So uh, we also like to distribute uh, something that we call intentions, but it doesn't mean only spe special intentions. It means uh, mm, what your character or what you really want to do in certain situation. So we like to focus in, in, in one part of the body. So uh, that is also how we came to that. Uh, uh, our all movement we do is intentional. Uh, we cannot do just the movement that we have uh, just like a general emotional imagination about. But uh, we have like a formal structure of what we do. And then we have inner intentional structure, which is really very kind of uh, precise and punctual line of impulses of either the character or a person in a situation that we build up uh, that he or she is uh, embodying on stage. So uh, we got to it because most of us, when we were starting with the company, we were having uh, uh, drama background studies, like Hannah uh, was studying uh, drama acting, Elishka was studying drama acting, and I was studying drama directing. But of course, uh, desiring to do in my life music composition and I ended up with Farm in the Cave. Uh, like a kind of mixture of these both, uh, yeah. uh, because I was also desiring to create uh, performances which could have such direct impact on the audience as I had when I was listening to the music, immediate, direct. Therefore, I was also interested to use the body of an actor uh, or understand the body of an actor as the music instrument in a certain way. So. Uh, this was maybe more about the action and maybe we could now move uh, to just show you quickly chosen uh, uh, maybe moments from our rehearsal in the current project uh, ephemery uh, introduce the project ah maybe okay okay so now uh, thank you hannah i will maybe introduce a little bit more uh, so uh, we were supposed to do first the project inside of the a big gallery, biggest gallery venue at Docks called FMRs. FMRs is in English, FMR. That we would uh, do like immersed theater in the gallery premises during uh, exhibition called Vanitas. Vanitas are those kind of paintings with either skulls or the flowers that are dying, putting our attention of in, on impermanency or death. And we wanted to make a simple concept that everyone from the people who enters that uh, exhibition space would be wearing either mask of the face of the sleeping person so the audience would be already uh, there would be 100 of the same faces in the space and one of and some of them would be us performers but because of the COVID, we understood we cannot go this direction because of interaction with the audience and because uh, because of pandemic situation, we are not allowed to do so. So we uh, changed the concept to, uh, uh, and we hope that this concept uh, hygienic uh, station would allow us to do, but finally they even did not allow us to do this. So we need to record this project instead of showing it and doing it live December. So we decided that if we have two people sitting in the, compartment of Paternoster elevator that is running through six floors on and on and on and on 
we could be uh, keeping all these uh, pandemic uh, uh, rules that there would be only two people in one compartment and they could be kind of witnessing the personal stories of what's going on. So I hope you can see, Kenneth, can you see? Yep. So this is how the Paternoster looks like. It's in a beautiful building of Lucerna. There is our Hana mm -hmm. inside of it. It's a, bit, a little bit, we have a problem with the signal, so it's getting a bit frozen. <laughs> Hana doesn't seem to be very happy to be there, but <laughs> she's there. So uh, the audience is uh, seated inside of the space and then they are running all around for 33 minutes. This is the project that we are working on and that we plan. And uh, maybe we can cut this and go to another showcases. And on each floors, there would be actions going on uh, from certain kind of personal uh, stories. Uh, here we have uh, Joelle with a uh, kid working on, and we imagine that the audience can see each action only for around 12 seconds. So it forces you to do that action or to make the message in a quite short time, uh, because then the audience goes to another floor. I hope you can see what I'm showing. This is our assistant Yurai running there around. Okay, we can go maybe to another showcase uh, from another floor. Can you still see what's going on? Yep. Good. This is another floor uh, where another stories are going on. Of course, you have to imagine that the audience is still moving from down to up in that 11 seconds. Uh, maybe another floor. So it's about these moments that you see for 12 minutes that you kind of are witnessing and that they speak, this is Elishka in her floor, about some personal story. And then you, inside of your head, you are combining what uh, it can talk to or what it can associate to you. So it's like accumulation, it's maybe more like panopticum, panopticum or kaleidoscope, kaleidoscope of a different stories maybe let's go uh, for the last floor uh, where would be like a composition of people falling asleep we were not doing this on the floor because it was so cold there that we had to do this in the studio but uh, still you can see a little bit of what's going on inside of this floor these are students of duncan center all of these recordings are from rehearsals so there is monica and me talking to the people or maybe let's move it to the 50s. Uh, yes, 50s. Yeah. Okay. okay, now something should start. Hopefully, I don't know if this is the first video or the second video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this would be going in a up floor. So every floor, some kind of situation is going on where we are in the conditions to be squeezed into important 12 maximum 12 seconds because everything is even more complicated because one cabin is going up the second cabin is going down and each floor has the different number of repeatings because when cabin which was on the left side comes back to the same floor on the right side uh, it's different timing on the first floor then on the second floor then on the third floor so it's like a mathematics which showed us which floor should have how many pictures exposed mm -hmm. all, all together. So maybe that's enough from the short demonstration of where we are right now. And of course, this all also does influence the way we would be working with sound action and the space because the audience is in permanent movement. We can't stop them. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the moments when you can catch something out of the action are limited. And it's, of course, uh, going through many floors. So this is what we would wish to do alive, but uh, we, uh, uh, for now, uh, have to rather record it on the video and wait for the moment when we could present this project alive for the audience, which we, of course, want very much because it's a new challenge for us.
Mm. So maybe also if you have any questions to us or you guys also have any questions to us, maybe now is the space. Could, could I ask uh, like just technical question that if the audience, they go up, they see these images, they come down and there is one person in the elevator when, when they arrive down, uh, do they get a, a chance after a while to go up again or how is if they keep up? Yeah, the elevators is circulating mm -hmm. all the time and down there are like a two blindfolded floors where would be mostly music and the audio story going on. Ah, oh, so they wait. Call it hell. So yeah. you see, you reach the low floor and then you go with the small lights in it, with the rather just the sound and the music composed, one floor, one more floor. Then it goes around like this and you are rising up again. And up, we call it heaven. It's a shorter one. You just go around like that. You know, some people think that the compartment goes upside down, but it's not true. That would be like a centrifuga. There's something, something different. Hmm. Yes. Well, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's quite intense. I mean, it's really kind of a, yeah, you're saying mathematics, I'm thinking more Sudoku or a jigs giant jigsaw puzzle in, uh, in three dimensions, four dimensions with time as well so uh yeah it's very interesting uh yeah so actually what we did that uh, we were starting first from uh, certain actions and uh, then we were giving to each pictures some most important intentional structure which is different from the movement structure so we know that there are in each this 11 seconds, there are at least three very crucial moments of what's going on inside of that situation that moving audience should be able to catch or should have the impact from, which is actually focusing you uh, to a quite high level of concentration because in the same time you have to respond to your partners but in the same time, you, of course, subconsciously or consciously are aware of that limit where the face of the moving audience inside of compartment is moving mm. and where yours, where it's disappeared and it's gone, you know. So yeah. uh, uh, something that we were having prepared in the slower rhythm, we are supposed to train inside of this limit of 11 or 12 maximum seconds when it's visible, uh, playing with the different relationships between these at least three very key important micro situations that are going on inside that situation. And they are even more important for us than just the physical movements that embodies these inner micro situations. And also that there is this audience of one that you, it's very special that the, the whole group is giving to one person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually two. So you can take your girlfriend or boyfriend or whoever is very close to you. So you could order like a chambre separé, we can call it, you know, for 33 minutes with uh, someone you want to be close to. And like this, we were so happy. Oh, we uh, uh, evolved the concept that will allow us as the only theater to perform even now when all theaters cannot perform in Czech Republic yeah. because of this two and a half uh, distance uh, from the performance to uh, the audience but even though uh, we cannot still perform in life so hopefully in the future we will mm. yeah so I am I can imagine there would be a lot more to talk about but maybe uh, let's uh, give now the word to uh, our artists and the teachers and the researchers who are here with us. And they could maybe just uh, point or express what you guys got inspired by Kenneth and Cooley or Farm in the Cave's work and uh, what you could carry with you towards your own training or your own work with other of your students or other of your uh, uh creators or colleagues around you so maybe we can at least uh, 
Start with some of you who want to. Okay, Lucas. So, uh, I come from a circus background, and I feel that uh, as a juggling and object manipulating background, and uh, my practice is really trying to see where objects and object manipulation meets uh, meets uh, movement. And from what I'm really getting here from Farm in the Cave and from your own practice is that this musicality is also very, very much, you can see this in contemporary circus now a lot, that people are really using this a lot, working with objects and also working with the musicality of objects and how this can uh, bring about. And what I really like is that from Farm I'm receiving that it's uh, the rhythm and the intentions and how different rhythms can have like specific, almost theatrical meanings and uh, intentions. And from you, I like this uh, laboratory sort of uh, way to think about how I can be attentive towards uh, what I'm doing with the objects. And a specific question or something that came to mind when I was watching now your, your videos would be, was uh, thinking about sound and for example, the envelope of sound that uh, sound has a certain uh, attack, release, decay, and sustain, and how this can also maybe influence movement. And movement, if we're able to analyze when the intention to start moving receives our brains, and when do we actually start moving, and how long does the movement last after we have stopped moving. So for me, this is just like interesting also in relation to if I throw in an object and I catch it, when does the throw start and when does it finish? And uh, just this whole analysis of juggling or of movement through sound and through the envelope. For me, this is interesting now. Yeah, exactly. I think it, it's a very, very good observation, I think. And uh, we've also been thinking in very much in similar terms, uh, especially this kind of ADSR envelope. Uh, is, uh, I think it's a very useful it's a useful me metaphor to um, to analyze, analyze the movements. and. Uh, and I think like what what we've been like because it's of course it's a very different movement if you have a slow attack mm -hmm. or uh, like very sharp attack you know like these th these kind of things they also resonate into the space uh, very differently uh, depending on how your uh, your sensors have been uh, calibrated mm -hmm. as well um, purely in those terms but uh, I think from for me also that I I've always uh, I started with music actually like before I went into theater and uh, dance <clears throat> as well. so that was my my roots uh, and uh, uh, for me I, like as a dancer as a performer for me that was always the dream to create something that was an integrated instrument <clears throat> where you are really actually playing the music while you are performing so that is basically what we have been building now through these years as well and um, and that kind of movement analysis that you're indicating is very much a part of that way of thinking and almost that, that there is not one action that creates this sound but it is a 360 degree presence that actually is the action hmm. and the reverb there could be into the brains of the observers into your own brain also like it comes yeah. back to the yeah. sort of like yeah, this mm -hmm. music terminology is quite yeah, I mean, you can think of it in terms of, of uh, resonance and feedback. Uh, there's another way to, to think about it as well, uh, in addition to the envelope uh, way of thinking. So what is the, uh, like, uh, if, you, if you think of it purely mechanic, acoustic mechanical terms, it's the thing that you have an exciter, you have a resonant body. So you excite something, you set it into vibration, you have a resonance body that then propagates into the space, into... Uh, into the perception of uh, audience members back into yourself as well. So there's already some kind of a feedback loop uh, like inherent in that thing, both between us and the space, us and the sound that comes in, but also between us and the audience as well, or what we imagine the audience <laughs> to be, because of course we don't know uh, as well, even though there are subtle cues that we can deduct something from. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Maybe I can uh, continue because, uh, also related to that. I'm coming from a. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. I'm coming from a dance background, and uh, right now I'm really interested in uh, because I went through like a lot of different aesthetics and different forms, and right now I'm really interested also with really communicate like how to uh, approach the, the creation of human material in a way that. Uh, that uh, it's not concrete or it's not descriptable, but at the same time, it can communicate with the spectator. 
So uh, because it's you know as a contemporary dancer is trained with a lot of different uh, different techniques, but at the same time they are all really abstract in the way that there's not many ways how to directly communicate with the or or this as I felt as a spectator as a performer that sometimes I cannot fully express what I want to communicate with the audience just by this concrete uh, movement form. So that's why also this move, uh, this work of, uh, for example, using intentions or being like very directive, how, how do I communicate and where do I send the movement and where do I send my intention and what is, like, in, with what intention I'm trying to fill up every movement. That's something that I'm not trying to, to observe and trying to incorporate into my, uh, research and my training and uh, I think it's very similar with uh, how you use the sound how you use the, the music and the, like um, these tools in your in your research and in your creation and I'm really interested in how because also like the, the sound is much more direct for the for the audience I feel and also it helps all from what I observe from your shows and from your uh, creations it creates much more uh, interesting way how to use your body also and like how to or more readable for me how when you when i when i observe you i feel like i can read much more and it's the same same way as i perceive like with family kid that i can really read much more what's happening because of these intentions and this direct uh focus so i maybe what what uh, just a small question what, what i would add is how to how you value the, because there are different aspects. There is the movement, there is the sound, there is like the all different aspects of the performance and how you value the, like, of course, you cannot say like, this is most important for me, but uh, but it seems that, that now you have to like on, on, a, on a horizontal level, like all these aspects, or maybe if you, if you aim for the spectator, like what is something that you, that you find most important or that you, that you find like the final thing that you like to communicate because like the sound that, that you're creating is is has the same for me the same value as if i would just for example listen to you and not watch i would have also some kind of uh, experience from your from your performance mm. yeah uh I, I i think i would answer uh, that um um uh I, I resonate with this word intention in a way, but uh, uh, this may not be the intention that I have, uh, the same intention that I w wish the audience to understand. So I, I, uh, the sensors or whatever task you are without the sensors, you can have the same, you train your intention to be to be present, to be alert to the, the, the task or the situation. And uh, with the, the sensors as well, that this uh, being really listening, really being in this space, that that's my intention. And then, um, then I would say this is the connection, the connection wh where a lot of things come together. And somewhere there is also this audience interpretation, but this is out of my reach. Like I have this, uh, uh, I, I, we have uh, talked a lot uh, that, uh, how about this communication, how, how much we want to actually uh, them to understand what we meant mm. and basically like for us uh, right now we are really there that we can uh, we can uh, clarify our intentions we can try to be more uh, listening more amazed more surprised more precise uh, uh, or more relaxed uh, however we feel and then we trust the people. Uh, it's a little bit like your elevator <laughs> project that they get what they get and they, they are their algorithms running around and they just connect with what they want. And, uh, but I can still stand well for my mm -hmm. uh, performance there and my, I'm connecting these different things and I'm this connector. Maybe yeah. that's... I think uh, one word that uh, I think we also mentioned it in the in the second video is the idea of emergence, emergent properties uh, that uh, say like you, you take a, a frame of metal, a couple of wheels, a bar and uh, pedals and so on, all of which have no uh, function on their own other end as pretty objects. But once you put them together, they suddenly get a completely new function that was not 
present in those individual parts. So you can actually have a bicycle, you know, you can ride somewhere with it. So um, from, from Nila, I think one of the most uh, amazing things is like how from this little building blocks, uh, emergence happens, some kind of a synergy happens that suddenly something it's very, usually it's very kind of a clear moment when you feel like, oh, now it's alive, you know, now it, it, it now it happened, you know, like it came, it went from construction to living. <clears throat> and it's often in a very kind of a specific, uh, specific moment in time. And then maybe it slips out of that again, and then you kind of go back into it. But I think this idea of, uh, and, and kind of emergent properties of a performance of a work of art is, uh, some kind of a for me like some fundamental priority okay any more yeah for me what yeah. is really yeah. yeah what is really amazing is that through this um lovely yeah what is uh, amazing is that through this uh, research and the uses of the uh, sensors you can really um, have um, and create the awareness and the realization of how the body um, is uh, functions. What is stillness? As you mentioned in the video, because we dancers have a really big issue with stillness or what is sharp, what is not. And um, But at the same time, I have a feeling that um, the direction we aim with Farm in the Cave is Again, as William said, how you are in the moment trying to hear, try to experience what it really is. So it's um, it both works are in the same direction, I think, in the way of perception and uh, awareness, awareness of yourself, of the partner, of the space, of everything. Mm. Mm. Okay, so maybe uh, uh, let's uh, see how this uh, meeting, this inspiration you generously shared with us. Uh, unfortunately, we could not do it alive through our practices physically as we would love to do with you, of course. But let's see where it can go or maybe these seeds somewhere are already planted and a uh, couple of years later we will see some very interesting performers performance of some someone from here uh, or whatever way or maybe uh, it will go further but anyhow it seems that uh, it's very um, fruitful and good that companies like us who are despite all the uh, uneasy time we live in, that we keep on researching uh, things because of our curiosity, but also because of our sincere interest to go further or to discover something that we did not know before and something that we cannot predict. So uh, that I think it is very positive that we find a way how to share and how to inspire each other and through this also support, because of course, something that we are uh, discovering, uh, if we don't uh, uh, give it further, uh, I think we cannot be really happy because only the joy that is shared and maybe given with love to someone else uh, uh, makes sense also for yourself. It mm -hmm. seems like that also in the work that uh, when you reach your audience uh, by the performance, is the experience you gave out of your heart, and uh, is the same when you reach your practices with us, or we try to reach our practices with you. Uh, that creates the action because then it creates the response. It creates uh, the understanding. We are not isolated. We are not here alone, despite the pandemic situation but we can still share uh, yeah. like this. So, uh, dear uh, Kenneth, dear Cooley, thanks much for a beautiful virtual meeting mm -hmm. with you. And uh, I really wish we are gonna 
do it in the future live or we find a way how to bring you back to Prague and or how to keep uh, uh, meeting in the rehearsal studio. All right. Thanks for everyone here. Thanks for Anneli, Yeromin, uh, our production manager. And uh, let's keep in touch. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, uh, know, waving time. Waving time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Ciao, ciao. Ciao, ciao.